This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. My name is Ewan Morgan, a professor of US Studies at the uh, Institute, and I'm also uh, director of the United States Presidency Centre. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, we're hosting a book launch event this evening, uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, Wiley Blackwell uh, companion uh, to uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, the latest uh, volume in a series uh, which will eventually uh, encompass the entire uh, uh, 44, by that time probably 45 or 46 <laughs> presidents. Uh, uh, um, but uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, contributing to uh, the companion to Richard Nixon, and uh, I'm, I'm also contributing uh, an essay to the forthcoming volume on Dwight D. Eisenhower, so uh, I don't uh, feel uh, I need to be too embarrassed when I'm standing here in front of you with three outstanding Theodore Roosevelt experts uh, uh, who are going to delight you tonight uh, on this Thanksgiving evening, and uh, many thanks for turning out on this uh, momentous day for Americans. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Douglas Eden, uh, who has done so much to set up this event, and he will say a few words about the Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, companion in particular. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Ewan. Well, welcome to everybody, and uh, happy Thanksgiving to you all. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Ewan, who is the head of the U.S. part of the Institute. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, director of the United States Presidency Center, so it's very appropriate that we have this launch here. And I want to also thank uh, Toby Peters, who can't hear me, he's outside, and, uh, and all the Jimenez for uh, doing all the necessary admin to make this possible. And uh, Joanne Diamond, who is here from Wiley Blackwell to sell you copies of our wonderful book. Uh, I'm sorry. Very sorry, and I, in a way, give apologies that Serge Ricard, the uh, uh, the producer and director and editor of this of this tome, could not be here tonight. He would very much like to be here. He was going to come from Paris, but uh, being a, a a thoroughly assiduous emeritus professor as he always is, he has. A viva a PA, of a PhD student tomorrow morning in at the Sorbonne, and he felt he couldn't desert her. <laughs> so, uh, so that's where Serge is. Otherwise, he would certainly be here. His task has been mountainous, momentous, and deeply appreciated by all concerned. I can tell you, and it would have been an impossibility for all 30 of the contributors to Serge's book to tell about the person here tonight. So, the the three of us will accept all of your peccadilloes, barbs, and Fair points. But it's a particular honor and pleasure for me to be here with two of my fellow authors and colleagues, Tony and Simon, to represent our large party of TR scholars and present this ambitious book to you. It's a particularly important volume in the historiography of Theodore Roosevelt and also in the historiography of American foreign policy in the 20th century. You may have seen on the notice for this event that Ewan believed TR was a near great president. But I'm here to argue that he was undoubtedly a great president. He was the first American president to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, not speculatively, I emphasize, <laughs> but after he accomplished a great act of peacemaking. He was the first president to realize America's great power status and to conduct foreign policy accordingly. Twenty years before TR became president, American GDP was already one-third larger than Britain's, twice as large as France's, and three times Germany's. Yet after the Civil War, it wasn't until Roosevelt that a president came to office with a clear concept of the nation's interests, a vision of the country's future, and a plan and style suited to the responsibility and capacity of a great power. Now today, the United States annually produces about 26% of all the goods and services in the world, in 1901, the first year of TR's presidency, it produced 27%. This is the measure of decline to so fashionable today to ascribe to the United States. Of course, Teddy didn't have to deal with a national deficit of $15 trillion. 
Despite being the world's greatest economic power, Americans still saw themselves as pioneers of a great continental republic, isolated from and exceptional to a world dominated by European imperialism. Americans were still decades away from considering themselves in any way responsible for global governance or world peace and stability. TR's world vision challenged this attitude, and one of his greatest achievements was to maintain immense popularity while leading Americans away from their native insularity and isolation. Of course, this great project was seriously interrupted after TR left office in 1909. <laughs> no president since John Quincy Adams was so well prepared for an important role in American diplomatic history. TR traveled in Europe from childhood. He spoke fluent French, and after studying six months in Dresden, was near fluent in German. He was awarded his BA from Harvard with highest honors, magna cum laude, and began writing his first and very successful book, The Naval War of 1812, at the age of 21. He was elected to the New York State Assembly at the age of 23, before he could complete his law degree at Columbia University. Within 20 years, he became the youngest ever president of the United States. <coughs> his foreign policy was to broadly define U.S. interests, but be clear which were vital to make certain the nation was strong enough to protect them, to respect the legitimate interests and sensitivities of other countries, never to bluff, to avoid war by being well prepared for it, to use force only when willing to strike hard and decisively, to allow an honorable adversary in diplomacy or war to save face in defeat, and to strive to provide Anglo-American leadership. Indeed, T.R. was founder of the special relationship with Britain. This was grounded in the belief that some nations and peoples have regressed beyond others with respect to their political cultures and international conduct, and that the world was far better off if the most advanced nations were also the most powerful. So he considered Britain's Royal Navy, then the world's largest, an American asset, and saw no need for the United States to be more than the world's second greatest naval power. When he became president, the U.S. Navy was the sixth largest in the world. By 1970, it was second, a development encouraged by conservative and liberal British governments. As William Tilchin has demonstrated, TR's foreign policy aspirations were extremely ambitious, and he pursued them simultaneously with great energy. Five are particularly important. First, the building of the special relationship with the British Empire. Second, establishing American preponderance and supplanting of Britain as the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere. Third, sharply expanding America's international role as a responsible great power. Fourth, contributing to peaceful and stable relations among the great powers of the world. And fifth, contributing to the progress of civilization as he saw it. It appears paternalistic to most of us today but Tia's policy to prepare the Philippine people for self-government demonstrated the sincerity of his concept of benevolent imperialism. He encouraged British leaders similarly to pursue a wise and liberal imperial <coughs> policy to uplift the peoples in the dependent colonies and possessions of the British Empire. Outraging contemporary racial sensibilities at home without apology T.R. had the great civil rights leader Booker T. Washington to lunch with him at the White House. When Britain and France agreed their entente cordiale in 1904, Roosevelt embraced France no less warmly than Britain. Indeed, he's probably the last U.S. president to have an unalloyed and lasting friendship with the French people and their political leaders. That's quite a lot to say. <laughs> <coughs> This is reflected today by the fact that this important book has been edited by a notable French academic, and that the mere centenary of T.R.'s post-presidential visit to Europe in 1910 was celebrated with a conference this year at the Sorbonne in Paris, <coughs> where T.R. addressed the French nation 101 years ago. In contrast, T.R. perceived Germany, Russia, and Japan to be potential enemies of the United States. He hoped Germany might eventually join the ranks of the most civilized, but he feared that imperial German aggressiveness and militarism made this unlikely. 
He saw Tsarist Russia as reactionary and utterly untrustworthy. He probably had the same view of Putin's Russia today. He had greater hope for Japan, but his respect and admiration were tempered by suspicion of Japan's intentions and imperial ambitions. It was no coincidence that when TR sent America's great new white fleet on a friendship cruise around the world in 1907, its first port of call was Tokyo, where incidentally it was received with great celebration. When war occurred between France's ally Russia and Japan, Roosevelt was concerned that Japan, the one non-European great power, should not be humiliated and alienated from the international system. He also feared that a distracted and weakened Russia would upset the balance of power in Europe. So when the opportunity arose, which he helped to create, he therefore intervened to bring the conflict to an end, satisfactory to both belligerents. For this, he was awarded his Nobel Peace Prize. But perhaps even more threatening was the decision of the German Kaiser to take the opportunity of Russia's distraction in the Far East to test the newly minted Anglo-French Entente in Europe. While dealing with the Russo-Japanese crisis at Portsmouth in 1905, Roosevelt was alarmed by the possibility of the situation being compounded into a world conflagration by this second crisis. Again, it was TR's cautious and skillful intervention that saved world peace. And it's been my privilege to write about it in this companion. Perhaps his piece de resistance was his, achieve was his achievement in so flattering the Kaiser that Wilhelm believed his humiliating climb down engineered by Roosevelt was in fact a great personal diplomatic triumph. But perhaps no less significant is that TR saved Britain's bacon when the British had not given up spl splendid isolation long enough to appreciate the extent of their peril. It's been observed that had it not been for Teddy Roosevelt, the Great War might have occurred nine years earlier as the consensus of modern Great War historians is that the road to 1914 began with the 1905-06 crisis, the question arises whether Rooseveltian diplomacy could have prevented that war had TR been on the scene. It gave me great pleasure when I was asked to speculate on this for publication next year. When I came to write TR's entry for the new Blackwell Encyclopedia of War, which was also published this month, I was gladly led by the facts to present TR in an encyclopedia of war as a fighter for peace. Unfortunately, those who followed him in the White House until late in Franklin Roosevelt's second term lacked a vision of equivalent realism, consistency, and strength. According to John Cooper, by the way, FDR allegedly always drew his greatest inspiration in foreign affairs from his elder cousin. It would take disastrous failures of presidential leadership, isolationism, appeasement, and the terrible experiences of two world wars before Theodore Roosevelt's mode of thinking and guiding precepts about U.S. foreign policy came back into the mainstream. Formidable, formidable and credible deterrent power, broadly and realistically conceived U.S. interests, and Anglo-American solidarity and leadership. The latter element has now been partly supplanted by other relationships as British power and morale have declined and other great civilized countries have come to the fore in the different regions of the world. Because of the elements I mentioned, reaction to the Great War, the rise in fashion of Wilsonian liberal internationalism in scholarly <coughs> circles, not to mention Pringle's hatchet job biography in 1931, FDR's dominant 12 years, and World War II and its aftermath, historical study of Theodore Roosevelt offered little profit for many years. The popular image of TR tended to depict him as the mad brother in the 1941 film Arsenic and Old Lace, brandishing a sword and charging up the house stairs, imagining that San Juan Hill. A handful of courageous scholars began to reverse this long trend nearly 60 years ago. John Morton Bloom, who died at 90 only last month, began the revival with the Republican Roosevelt in 1954. The Republican Roosevelt, the title itself, conveys the extent to which TR had become neglected. Various errors, misjudgments, and omissions in Bloom's book 
also bore testament to the years of scholarly neglect. But as Bloom's New York Times obituary said, the book was pivotal in establishing the 26th president's reputation as one of the country's great chief executives. Together with Elting Morrison and Alfred Chandler, Bloom edited between 1951 and 1954 the eight volumes of the Letters of Theodore Roosevelt, which at last opened the way to more extensive TR scholarship. And this was followed by Howard K. Beale's seminal Theodore Roosevelt and the Rise of America to World Power in 1956, derived from lectures delivered in 1953, and still a majestic and invaluable introduction to the subject, and probably the most cited reference after TR's own letters in this companion. Then in 1961 came William H. Harbaugh's outstanding one-volume biography, splendidly revised since 1975 as The Life and Times of Theodore Roosevelt. The first volume of Edmund Morris's massive biography was published in 1979, the third and final volume appearing only last year. Progressively since 1980, more and many significant works on TR have been produced by many excellent historians including the editor of, its book, of this book and its contributors. When I began my own research on TR 50 years ago, I received little encouragement or interest in the subject and felt quite isolated as a scholar. Today, it is a pleasure to attend conferences and symposia embracing this subject in the company of many talented and enthusiastic scholars like my colleagues here. And I can tell you the truth of that. A companion to Theodore Roosevelt, signifies an important stage in Rooseveltian scholarship. It marks the culmination of a period in scholarship that has succeeded in restoring the historical reputation of TR to its rightful place, appropriate to a resident of Mount Rushmore. In including so many Roosevelt scholars, it marshals the scholarly TR army to continue their work. All of us involved can be proud to be of that party and all thanks to Serge Ricard for making this possible. For non-TR specialists, American history scholars can now see more clearly the significance of TR's square deal and progressive new nationalism for Wilson's New Freedom, FDR's New Deal, JFK's New Frontier, mm -hmm. LBJ's Great Society, and on and on. It all began with TR. Of TR's speak softly and carry us a big stick, we have finally got Truman's containment policy. For the foreign policy specialists among us, TR's introduction of America to great power politics over 100 years ago continues to offer great lessons to us today and tomorrow. Before I close, I'd like to quote from the great man. From his speech to the French in 1910, which sold 5,000 copies in five days and was translated and reprinted in many European cities and America. It became known to British and American readers as the man in the arena and is entirely characteristic of Tia. After receiving the loudest applause from his audience in Paris, when he attacked skeptics of lettered leisure, who cloistered in academe, sneered at anyone trying to make the real world better, he said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds can have done them better. I'll start over there. <laughs> um, after receiving the loudest applause from his audience in Paris when he attacked skeptics of lettered leisure, who foisted in academe sneered at anyone trying to make the real world better, he said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be 
with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. That was 30 years before Churchill offered blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Whether you're a specialist or not, I hope you'll enjoy this book. Thank you.